Hello, everyone, and welcome to another mini sky tonight. So I made a suggestion a while back, and believe it or not, a few were asked to talk about this. So I wanted to discuss what is known as the HR diagram. It's a powerful and useful tool that basically categorizes all the stars that we have come across so far and puts them in not only temp in a category of temperature, but spectral class, but color, and so much more. So let's dive into the history of where this diagram came from and look at it itself and to kind of explore what unique features this diagram holds. So a bit of background history. Henry Draper was basically looking at all the stars and he created this catalog of all these stars that he's come across and their positions and everything. But it was a very cumbersome catalog and it was very disorganized. He was just doing it based upon like their position in the sky and it was hard to keep track of all these different stars. This is where Annie Jump Cannon comes in and quote unquote, the calculators. They were brilliant women and astronomers who had unique techniques of being able to differentiate these stars and they started categorizing all these different stars that from the Henry Draper catalog into their own categories and basically organizing them in such a way that it was easy to track. So rather than just all these, these are all the stars of the constellation such and such and these are all the stars of the constellation such and such, she was organizing them by their own particular type. At first she was doing it based upon color, but then later on um, with the help of Edward Pickering, they were able to realize that there were certain unique features in these stars that made them kind of all connected. And she was the one who created the famous known Harvard spectral system based upon their spectral type. Now, if you're unfamiliar with spectroscopy, believe it or not, I did a video that talks about spectroscopy and why it's important in astronomy. So if you want to check out that video, I'll leave a link up here and you can check out how we use spectroscopy in astronomy. And of course, here's Annie Jump Cannon and the calculators. So it was a group of brilliant women who had a keen eye for seeing different details in stars and looked at all these different details of individual stars that were in the catalog and they themselves observed these stars to look for unique features. And it originally started off with an alphabetical lettering system to where they noticed that many of the blue stars they put in cal uh, depending upon their variants of blue, like I said, they had very keen eyes to basically put them in different categories. And so from A to D was your kind of blue stars, your E to L's was your orange and yellow stars, M and N were their own unique categories because they were, there was a jump in color. But then later on, they discovered stars that were even beyond these spectrums. Some that were even like deep brown in color. And they noticed like some of them that existed in terms of the colors, like in between, as well as they noticed that some stars like were incredibly bluer than even their A structure. So they had to reformat it. And it was through several scientists that noticed that many star colors emit from the chromosphere. With a chromosphere is basically the, uh, this kind of surface just above the photosphere, which is the light sphere that we can see. And that color is basically related to its temperature. So how hot the star is, is basically the color that you would see. And this all states back to black body radiation. Everything that has energy radiates. You radiate, I radiate. Anything that has some type of energy radiates in some form of way. For us as humans, we radiate in infrared light temperature. So that's why we're able to take temperature guns and read our temperature every day because it's detecting IR signatures from our body that are being emitted. And believe it or not, stars emit in more than one spectrum. So here we are looking at uh, a black body radiation, like a perfect black body that emits out everything. And at certain temperatures, you can see peaks in the visible range, as well as it's still visible in different ranges as well. 
So let's bring color into it. The more blue in color you are, the hotter in temperature you are. And the more red in color you are, the cooler in temperature you are. And they noticed that given the uh, Wien's law, that they were able to calculate with color their temperatures, given a base upon the energy. And so they noticed that stars at certain temperatures in these individual ranges could be placed in different categories. So they placed it based upon these color systems. And they noticed that it did rearrange some of the star structures, but it was still relatively good. And last but not least, spectral. They started looking at the spectral analysis of these individual stars, and they noticed certain lines disappear the hotter you get. And that some lines also appear, more lines appear when you get cooler. So by looking at some of these certain lines, and this is where the fine, uh, keen eyes really take effect, because you have to look for these individual lines in the spectral analysis, and it's very difficult. And so trying to look for these individual lines that appear and some that disappear was incredibly difficult, but they were able to figure out on a spectrum like where some of these stars would be placed. And so it left with the final statement of OBAFGKM as kind of like the standard for spectral types for different types of stars based upon their temperature, their spectral class, and their color. And Annie Jumcan and the calculators were able to create this Harvard standard system. So I always found it easier to kind of remember the spectral classes of the stars by using this anagram of O, B, A, fine, guy slash girl, kiss me. So, and the great thing about anagrams is you can put whatever words you want into them. So if it helps you remember them, go for it. So from the Harvard system that was used for a good number of years, Inar, I apologize if I mispronounce this name. It's, it's a European name and it's always difficult for me to pronounce some of those different types of names. Inar Hertzsprung and Henry Russell worked together to think that, hey, maybe with if these are categorized in these different ways, what other things can we associate with this uh, Harvard system? Could we infer other different types of features of individual stars based upon this? And could we even look at stellar evolution? And so this was a big step to just simply basically putting, uh, categorizing um, stars in their own little compartments, like what Annie Jem Cannon and the calculators did, they took it a step further and worked upon their work to say, hey, can we infer evolution of stars? So for them, it was like looking at pictures of individual people in different ages of their life, and they started to realize, hey, can we infer human evolution in that way, like looking from infants all the way up to the elderly and looking at the life track of a human. They thought, can we do that for stars? And as well as, can we infer mass? Can we infer radius? Can we infer a lot of different things? And so they started to create diagrams of some of the stars from the Henry Draper catalog and use some of the Harvard system uh, findings to basically start putting uh, stars in a diagram of some kind and to see how they kind of relate with one another. And they started to notice some patterns. And of course, the diagram had to go through several revisions because the first couple of diagrams, everything was chaotic. There were stars everywhere based upon different aspects. But as they fine-tuned it and did different types of axes and things, they noticed certain patterns started to appear. And today, this is the HR diagram that we know of. And these are the patterns that are starting to form. That most stars with temperature on the bottom in Kelvin and solar and, br and brightness on the left, like how bright the star is, as well as this, put the spectra class on the bottom and their colors, they notice that certain trends started to follow with brightness. 
And this is one of the changes that they put on there. They originally put spectra class on one end and Kelvin on another and everything was just everywhere. But when they put brightness as one of the units and then did the temperature on the bottom, they noticed this pattern, like most stars landed upon this line and that you had a few outliers in different pockets. And that's what fascinated them, that most of the stars landed on this line. And yes, you had a few outliers, but it was most of the stars landed upon this long curved line. And this is what they call the main sequence line. This was a star that was living out the main stages of its life. And so they noticed that, okay, if a star is fusing and it's going through the natural nuclear processes and just a stable star in itself, it's not too old, not too young, it was on this line. And so they, that fascinated them because then they noticed that, hey, on this line, many of the stars that had this kind of temperature and this kind of brightness seem to also have this kind of radius. And you can also even imply masses on this as well. As you can see right here, the, the more brighter the blue, they noticed that they had higher masses. And the lower down towards the M's, they had lower masses. So basically you can for a lot of information along the main sequence line, like a star's mass, a star's uh, spectral type, and so much more. And they noticed that many of these main sequence stars, the lower mass indicated that they didn't have a lot of material to fuse. So hence why they're a deep redder color because they're relatively cooler because they're trying to conserve energy. Whereas in many of the stars that are bright blue, they had so much material that they just are accessing it off. And they're also able to infer lifetimes. Like I said, the evolution of stars, like how long will a star live if it's burning up so much material? And they were able to compose all of that information onto one diagram. But then they also notice the evolution goes a step further when it comes to the death of certain stars. And they noticed that the giants and supergiants tended to be stars that were going into later stages in their lives. That they would leave the main sequence line and as they evolved, they would basically become supergiant stars because they would blow up, or not blow up per se, they would um, bulge up. They would basically become bloated in a way as they go further in their life. And then eventually as they puff out of their outer shells, they could either become white dwarfs. And then in newer versions of this diagram, you also have neutron, uh, neutron stars and a bunch of other things like black holes on this list as well. So this diagram is basically a incredible tool that once you find a particular star, you can know a lot of its information about that particular star just based upon where it is on the HR diagram. And sometimes the different numbers that you would see, like what we saw back here with the spectral types, like the zeros and the sixes and the um, ones and things of that nature, it's just, it's based upon just how far to the left or to the right in terms of ticks it is in that spectral class. So the closer you are to the left, you are a zero. The closer you are to a right, you're a six or a seven. So the closer you are to one side or the other, it depends upon where you are on a spectra class. It's basically a, a sliding scale depending upon all the different other factors of that particular star. So this is the glorious HR diagram and it's a useful tool in astronomy. And basically some of the main features that you can get about stars. And so if you know where, if you're looking for a particular star and you can find it, you can know a lot of information about that star based upon where it's located on the HR diagram. So here's a discussion about spectral types, the stars and the amazing HR diagram. If you have any questions or comments, leave it down in the comments below. If there's a topic you would love for me to cover over, leave it down in the comments as well. And until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and as always, never stop learning.